morning. As I said, we will be looking at a portion of the Heidelberg Catechism together over three short messages, and also then following those messages, we will have prayer and a song, and I will in include our congregational prayer as part of those prayers after each portion of the message. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The first question and answer that we will be looking at is question and answer two. After talking about the comfort that we know that we belong to Jesus Christ, our faithful Savior, it asks, what must you know to live and die in the joy of this comfort? And the answer states three things. First, how great my sin and misery are. Second, how I am set free from all my sins and misery. And third, how I am to thank God for such deliverance. And this is the structure then of the Heidelberg Catechism. It's broken down into those sections, misery, deliverance, and gratitude. How we live in gratitude for what Christ has done. Part of... The section on misery is question and answer five. It asks, can you live up to all this perfectly? That is, can we live up to the law of God perfectly? And it says, no. I have a natural tendency to hate God and my neighbor. And then it follows it up with question and answer six, and it asks, did God create people so wicked and perverse? And it says, no. God created them good and in his own image, that is, in true righteousness and holiness, so that they might truly know God their creator, love him with all their heart, and live with God in eternal happiness to praise and glorify him. The first section of the Catechism deals with misery. It's interesting to note that even though as Reformed people we often get criticized for focusing too heavily on sin and misery, it's actually the shortest section of the entire catechism. It's interesting how it says that in order for us to live and die in the joy of the comfort, that we need to know sin and misery. So this made me think, what is misery? And so I asked the congregation, and some responded. I asked, what is misery? Could you fill in the blank? Misery is, and here's some of the responses. Misery is feeling lonely and far from God while knowing it is self-induced because God is near and wants us to come close. But somehow I still catch myself sometimes in that place of loneliness. Misery is the remembrance of times that were happier and realizing they are now lost. Misery is when a loved one is hurting and you are helpless in how the outcome develops. Misery is being lost in depression, drowning in tears that won't stop, being buried under the thoughts in my mind that suck me in. It's feeling like God has let go when I really need to feel him holding on. Misery is feeling helpless. It's the worst times in my marriage when I just couldn't save it. When my child was so sick and there was nothing I could do. Seeing my mom sick and sad that I cannot fix it. Misery is an empty wallet. It is being so far removed from God and his redeeming grace and not recognizing it. Misery is realizing that I unfailingly do not live a life pleasing to God. 
Misery is the only thing in the world that has no end or edge. Misery is hardship and suffering. Misery is contagious. It loves company. Misery is all of these things and more. Misery is, as the Catechism describes, knowing that we cannot live up to the law of God perfectly. That we do not love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, and that we do not love our neighbor as ourselves. And knowing that we cannot live up to this perfectly, as it is described in question and answer 5. The passage in Ephesians 2 says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live, when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following the desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. The misery that people described is the fact that as a result of our sin and brokenness in the world, it comes because of the fall. Lord's Day 3 of the Catechism describes how we got to this point, how there is so much brokenness, how there is so much sadness in this world. It's all because of sin and the fall. Now when I say that it's a result of sin and the result of the fall, I need you to hear me clearly that it's not saying it's because of your specific sin we have the brokenness in the world. It's not a direct result of your personal sin. No matter what you hear from some other evangelical leaders, the coronavirus was not given because of your personal sin. Cancer is not something that God gives because of your sin. But there's brokenness in the world, there's hurt, there's suffering, all because of sin in general, because of the fall. And if you're wondering, how then can a God who claims to be good allow all of this to happen, stay tuned to next week when we talk about God's providence. We may say it's not fair. I didn't sin. I wasn't the one who messed up in the Garden of Eden. So why do I have to suffer the consequences? The Catechism reminds us in question and answer 6 that we were made in God's image. We were made holy and righteous and just. But in question and answer 7, it reminds us that Adam and Eve sinned, and as a result, all of humanity sins. As human beings, we are then created, we, we are now created in sin. We were created good and had everything perfect, except one thing. God created us good and perfect, and we had everything except one thing. The fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Craig Barnes says that every day, Adam and Eve had to walk by this tree and remember that they were never created to have it all. And that is God's idea of paradise. We weren't created to have it all, and yet that was still paradise. What a powerful concept. We weren't created to have everything, yet that is what our human nature wants and desires now. We're inclined to think that we should have it all, that everything should belong to us. But we weren't created that way. Barnes says that instead, instead of enjoying the blessings of the, the many fruits that we are given, we become obsessed about what we don't have. That idea is mind-blowing to me. To think that we weren't created with everything and yet it was still paradise. That we weren't created to have everything around us. But it was still perfect. And as Barnes says, instead of enjoying what we do have, we become obsessed with the things that we don't have. 
We are, as Paul says in Ephesians, dead in our transgressions and sins. We become caught up in gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts, as Paul says in verse 3. We're stuck in our sin and misery. Lord's Day 3 highlights how we got to where we are. Lord's Day 4 highlights who God is, that He is just, and He's merciful. Which, if you read, it adds to what seems to be already depressing news. For question and answer 9 reminds us that we were created with the ability to follow God's law of love. Yet we failed. We were tempted by the devil and we fell into sin. And because of that, question and answer 10 says that God is terribly angry. Terribly angry about our sin. And as a just judge, he punishes them now and in eternity. Again, it sounds extremely depressing. Yet there's a glimmer of hope. Question and answer 11. But isn't God also merciful? It says that God is certainly merciful, but he's also just. His justice demands that sin committed against his supreme majesty be punished with the supreme penalty, eternal punishment of body and soul. How is this a glimmer of hope? And how does this, knowing all of this, help us to live in the joy and the comfort of what we learned about last week? It's important to know the sin and misery that we are in. It's important in order to fully understand what God has done for us, in order to understand how we belong to Jesus, we first need to understand what he did for us and why. Because we're stuck in our sin and misery. But there is a glimmer of hope. It's pointing us to God's mercy. It says that he is merciful, but he's also just. But when we understand our sin and our misery, and we understand the promise of eternal punishment, it makes us much more appreciative of how we can get out of it. And as a hint to what is to come, it isn't anything we can do but it is what God will do and what he does do for us. Let us pray. Lord, we confess to you our sin and our brokenness. As Paul says, we were dead in our sin and transgressions. We were caught up in gratifying the the sinful nature. Lord, we pray that you would forgive us from our sin. We look around us at the brokenness of the world in which we live and we recognize it is a result of the fall, the result of sin in the world. There is misery and we live in a broken world. There are people who are hurting. We are all hurting and suffering. And so, Lord, we ask that we may look to you. Lord, we, we look around us and we see the brokenness There is suffering from the coronavirus. There is suffering from broken relationships. There is suffering from sicknesses and illness like cancer. Lord, we are reminded of how broken the world is. And we pray for your restoration. We pray especially, Lord, for Kathy Wind in this past week with the discouraging news that she received. We pray, Lord, for a miracle that you would work in her life and in her body. That you would heal her from the cancer she has. But Lord, we pray for the strength to face it in the weeks and months ahead. Lord, we pray for those who mourn. We pray for the Delu family as Frank lost his mother this past week. And Lord, we know that death is a result of the fall. And it's not the way you intended it. So comfort those who mourn. Lord, we pray for those who are suffering from the effects of the shutdown. We pray for those who are struggling with their mental health. Encourage them and be near to them. 
We pray for those who are affected and infected with the coronavirus. We pray that you would heal them and restore their health. Lord, be with all those who are lonely. Help them to feel your presence with them wherever they are. And Lord, help us to look to your mercy and to your grace to restore us to the way you intended us to be. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.